Now I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Um, he's going to be addressing dietary treatment using the Mediterranean diet. This is Dr. Michael Osner. Um, he's a cardiologist. He's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the, a fellow of the American Heart Association. He's a medical director at the Center for Prevention and Wellness at Baptist Health Hospital in South Florida and private practice, voluntary assistant professor of medicine and cardiology at the University of Miami um, School of Medicine. He's from Miami, Florida, and I'm very happy to welcome our first speaker. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I saddled up my horse yesterday and headed west, and here I am. So we're going to be discussing the Mediterranean diet um, and how we can utilize the Mediterranean diet in our practice to take better care of patients. So the objectives uh, of my talk uh, really um, are summarized here. It's to discuss the role of the Mediterranean diet in improving cardiometabolic health and lowering cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality. It's to review the clinical trials that support the Mediterranean diet. And uh, finally, to cite the key components of a Mediterranean diet that favorably impact heart health. Now, I'm going to start my talk this morning by having everybody put down their coffee cup and turn and look at the person sitting right next to you. Look them right in the eye. <clears throat> because one of you is going to die from this condition. One of you is going to die from this condition. So what's this condition? This is an atherosclerotic plaque that has ruptured. Uh, and when it ruptured, here you have an occluding thrombus. And it snatches people. Uh, suddenly and often without warning. And, you know, clearly uh, it's a, every 30 seconds somebody drops dead from a heart attack, uh, sudden cardiac death, uh, half the people don't make it to the hospital. And everybody know this gentleman right here? Yeah. Tim Russert, a well-known political reporter who had, for NBC, and in, in the middle of the day at 1.30 in the afternoon, Several years ago, he clutched his chest, fell down, and dropped dead from a heart attack. Now, one thing about Tim Russert is that his so-called bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, was under 70. 68 was very low. And, uh, you know, clearly nobody could understand, why did Tim Russert drop dead? You know, uh, certainly we understand it now. We, uh, Tim Russert is really the, the poster person for residual risk. If you have a flawed diet, if you don't exercise, if you're under a lot of stress, if you have high triglycerides, if you are showering your vascular endothelium with atherogenic small dense particles, you're at significant increased risk of having an event. And we'll talk more about that today. How about women? There are a lot of women here today. And <clears throat> what is the biggest threat to women? You know, this is a, a this, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve says it all. He goes, here's women about the time of, me of menopause. Um, and you can see that uh, this blue line represents death from heart attack. The yellow line's death from stroke. Down here, all of the causes of, of uh, death from breast cancer to lung cancer to colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer. Cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in women and in men and not only in the United States, but around the world. And I think we do a poor job uh, really addressing this issue. And we certainly uh, do a great job of having the latest and greatest stents, the non-coated stents, the minimally invasive robotic surgery, uh, the latest uh, uh, medication that uh, uses monoclonal antibodies. But you know, we we're gonna beat this disease with a uh, knife and a fork and a good pair of walking shoes. And we're not emphasizing lifestyle intervention enough in this country or, for that matter, around the world. So we're at the dawn of a new era in cardiovascular medicine, an era where we can 
basically take this ferocious beast uh, <clears throat> called cardiovascular disease and reduce it to a harmless pussycat. So it's not inevitable that half of you have to succumb to this disease. This is a preventable disease. And I'm going to discuss how uh, the Mediterranean diet can help us along the way uh, to be able to be in a position to make ourselves virtually heart attack proof. So what is this new era? This new era is that atherosclerosis is no longer considered to be a bland cholesterol storage disease, which was felt to be the case for literally uh, decades, that it was uh, basically a developed sludge in your arteries, just like, uh, you know, at home you develop sludge in your pipes and then you get a, a blockage uh, and you call the guy in the rotor-rooter truck and he comes out and he unclogs your sink. Well, you know, heart disease is much more dynamic than that. And atherosclerosis, we know what the root cause is. It's the retention of atherogenic ApoB lipoproteins in the vascular wall, followed by a maladaptive, and I may add deranged, inflammatory response. So cardiovascular disease prevention with lifestyle intervention and medical therapy is the optimal approach to treat, to prevent, and indeed to reverse atherosclerosis. So <clears throat> what kind of diet do we follow in the United States? Well, I call the diet the toxic American diet because it's highly processed, it's calorie dense, and it's nutrient depleted. And it leads to a spike in uh, glucose and triglycerides and overwhelms our metabolic capabilities of the mitochondria. It produces free radicals, leads to inflammation and oxidation and, uh, and a number of other factors culminating in cardiovascular disease. This was a great study by O'Keefe and colleagues where they looked at the typical Western or American meal and they found that after eating the typical meal in the United States, we get a sudden spike in, a sudden spike in glucose as, uh, and a sudden spike in triglycerides um, from this uh, highly processed food that we're eating. And that translates, that translates, if you look down here, into a, uh, a sudden increase uh, in inflammation as reflected by C-reactive protein an increase in oxidative stress as reflected by nitrotyrosine and a decrease in flow-mediated dilation. And it really uh, is important that we understand that we're, that's one of the leading uh, causes of puts, puts us on the road to cardiovascular disease, as in the case of Tim Russert and as in the case of literally millions of other people. So the Mediterranean diet is the optimal diet for the prevention of cardiometabolic disease. And I <clears throat> don't use those, these terms lightly because I think that you're going to hear about other diets today, the, 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 the vegan or vegetarian diet. You're going to hear about the low-carb diet. I think all these diets are, you know, have their uh, strengths. Uh, but I think that when you have different dietary patterns, which one we, sh we should recommend to the person who's sitting across from us uh, is, is the type of diet that is adjudicated not by hype or, you know, not by what the latest uh, fad diet of the day. It should be adjudicated by science, clinical trial evidence. And you have to ask your question, has this particular diet been shown to not only prolong life, but allow people to live a healthier life? And I think that if one looks at the science, it points in the direction of a Mediterranean diet. So what is a Mediterranean diet? If you look at the basic, uh, uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean pyramid, at the base, it's not even food. It's daily physical activity. Um, and certainly, it's a lifestyle. Uh, we know that uh, it's regular consumption of whole grains. It's fruits and vegetables of all different color. It uh, brings a lot of the antioxidants to the table. It's beans, legumes, nuts, uh, olive oil, uh, which we'll talk about, cheese and yogurt. Uh, and then a weekly consumption of uh, fish, and especially cold water omega-3 rich fish, whether it be salmon, uh, whether it be uh, tuna, trout, sardines. Uh, you know, all of these types of fish are rich in omega-3 fat, and we'll talk about that. 
along with poultry. And you can see at the very top, you know, it's really, as far as sweets, uh, most of the desserts in the Mediterranean region is uh, fresh fruit. You don't see sugar, refined sugar, refined starches. Uh, and uh, certainly the consumption of meat is infrequent. You know, it's certainly, uh, if you look at uh, red meat consumption, it's uh, uh, two, three, four times a month. And it's not because they woke up in the Mediterranean regions 5,000 years ago and said, I think we're going to eliminate red meat. They couldn't afford it. So they ate from the earth and they ate from the sea. But as I'm going to discuss today, some of the newer data that shows that uh, regular consumption of red meat is not necessarily good for us and, in fact, raises mortality. So this was uh, a, uh, the Mediterranean eating pattern, which was published by Walter Wellett from the Harvard School of Public Health many years ago. And it's basically what we just discussed. It's plant foods, it's fresh fruit as the daily dessert, olive oil, and I'll talk about olive oil because if it's not extra virgin, non processed olive oil, throw it out the window. It's not doing you any good. It's uh, dairy products. It's uh, the fish and poultry, uh, low uh, to moderate consumption of eggs, red meat certainly consumed in low amounts, wine, especially red wine, which is packed with uh, polyphenols and resveratrol consumed with meals uh, in low to moderate amounts. And it's a diet that is not a low-fat diet, but it's a low-saturated fat diet and certainly uh, low to non-existent trans fat. So roughly 25 to 35 percent of energy comes from polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fat, and we'll discuss that. So why is the Mediterranean diet so effective? Well, uh, we can uh, spend the entire morning on this slide and discuss every aspect of this, but it improves not only the, the lipid uh, profile, but also lipoproteins. It improves insulin sensitivity. It reduces oxidative stress. It lowers inflammation. Uh, it improves endothelial function, lowers thrombogenic risk, has been shown to lower blood pressure, and lowers the risk of metabolic syndrome. So, you know, what has been the, uh, one of the things I'm going to discuss is uh, something that's very important, and that is early, uh, our early ancestors, uh, what was the biggest threat? It was diseases of undernutrition. And if not for adipose tissue, uh, certainly we would have perished because uh, we would not have been able to survive the famines. We would have died of starvation. And certainly adipose tissue allowed us to store energy in the form of fat. Now, modern man, as you can see at the, uh, on, on the right, suffers from disease of overnutrition. And the very tissue that saved early uh, man and woman is now killing us. And we're going to go through this very, rather quickly. And it basically, adipose tissue is, uh, as, as all of you know, is loose connective tissue, uh, which are composed of adipocytes and a, what's called a stromal vascular fraction, which are pre-adipocytes, fibroblasts, and uh, other cells. And the term adiposopathy, or sick fat, and I give a lot of credit to Dr. Harold Bays, who really helped move this science along, is uh, defined as dysfunctional fat promoted by positive caloric balance and physical inactivity in genetically susceptible individuals that lead to cardiometabolic risk and promote cardiovascular disease. So the uh, adipocyte can release adipokines. And it's important that you understand this because the majority of adipokines are pro-atherogenic. And it includes uh, leptin, which the peripheral manifestations of leptin really uh, promote all aspects of metabolic syndrome. Pi-1, which is a prothrombotic uh, adipokine, the anti-inflammatory adipokines, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, uh, angiotensinogen, uh, which can raise blood pressure, um, uh, MCP, monocyte chemotractic protein, which facilitates monocyte entry into the vascular wall that kicks off the atherosclerotic disease process. All of this can be released by uh, the adipose tissue, and especially 
uh, dysfunctional adipose tissue and visceral uh, uh, adipose tissue. The one good guy is adiponectin. It's an anti-atherogenic adipokine. And it's really 80% um, of our adipose tissue is in our peripheral subcutaneous regions of our body. And it uh, actively produces adiponectin. So you can imagine if we develop that dysfunctional state and we decrease the amount of adiponectin and increase the uh, uh, number of the amount of the uh, proatherogenic adipokines, how fat uh, and especially visceral fat and uh, ectopic fat can lead to all the, the diseases that I'm going to discuss. So I'm going to take you through how does this come about. And um, again, I, I, that's an excellent article written by Dr. Harold Bays, and uh, I recommend everybody read it. But essentially, it, the, the, it stems from uh, improper nutrition. So it starts out by positive caloric balance, especially people following this fast-paced diet. You get, you know, sedentary lifestyle. And so you get, uh, whether it's high sugar or high saturated fat, the liver turns a high sugar, high refined starch into fat. And it's packaged as triglycerides. It goes to the adipose tissue, that, uh, the triglycerides that aren't used for and for storage purposes, and basically what you have is the adipocytes can handle it. Now, if you have too much uh, energy coming in at one time, uh, and the adipocyte can start to increase in size. Well, what happens, and we call that adipocyte hypertrophy, you know, if it gets to a point where uh, it increases rapidly, it can actually, uh, there's two choices. It could either uh, signal pre-adipocytes to come in and take over, or it can replicate, or it can continue to uh, increase, uh, and adip adipocyte hypertrophy will eventually lead to intraorganelle stress, especially in the endoplasmic reticulum. We produce proteins uh, within the adipocyte. It leads to insulin resistance. Once we get insulin resistance, we get uh, lipolysis of the triglycerides to, to, uh, back to uh, fatty acids, free fatty acids. They leave the adipocyte, they hitch a ride on albumin, and then we're off to the races because our body doesn't like free fatty acids and non-adipocyte tissue. Why? Because of monoglycerides and ceramides are toxic to tissue. And so, for instance, if it goes to the pancreas, it could do damage to the beta cells, increasing the likelihood of type 2 diabetes. If it goes to skeletal muscle, it could lead to uh, insulin resistance and skeletal muscle. If it goes to the liver, it could lead to fatty liver, uh, and on and on and on. And very importantly, it could go and surround blood vessels, perivascular fat, and increase inflammation in the perivascular region and lead to atherosclerosis from a different mechanism, the so-called outside to inside mechanism. This is a fascinating concept. What we want to do is try to avoid uh, the development of, uh, of sick fat. And not only that, when we get adiposopathy and the free fatty acids uh, leave the adipose tissue, we then get uh, the adipose, the, the free fatty acids going to the liver, and so the liver is going to uh, package uh, this in, as triglycerides into VLDL particles. The B VLDL particles are triglyceride rich, and they basically, there's an exchange uh, uh, for triglycerides with LDL, uh, and so LDL becomes triglyceride rich. It's acted upon by lipase, and you get small, dense particles that are highly atherogenic and uh, certainly can uh, cause problems. It also can lead to remnant uh, particles, VLDL remnants and IDL, um, and uh, they are also highly atherogenic. And it can also, the same process can occur with HDL, where you get this exchange, uh, and when uh, it acted on by lipase, you get small, less functional HDL particles and a dissociation of APOA1 to HDL, which is then cleared by the kidney, so we get not only less functional HDL, but decreased HDL. Well, we all know what metabolic syndrome is. I'm not going to go through all the, uh, the, the factors uh, of uh, metabolic syndrome, but abdominal obesity, high triglycerides, low HDL, impaired fasting glucose, and elevated blood pressure. But 
<clears throat> the one thing that is important is that metabolic syndrome, for patients who have metabolic syndrome, uh, are at significant increased risk of cardiovascular disease mortality, drives atherosclerotic disease mortality. And the driving force, largely behind metabolic syndrome, is adiposopathy. And the driving force behind that is a flawed diet and, of course, physical inactivity. So it's important that all of you understand that. Now, why am I talking about a lot of this? Well, we know how to right the ship. Uh, this was a study uh, by Catherine Esposito and colleagues uh, that looked at the Mediterranean diet versus a control diet, which was uh, really uh, a, a, a standard diet as usual. Um, and they noted the significant reduction in body weight, insulin resistance, blood glucose, inflammatory markers, blood pressure, improvement in lipid and lipoproteins, uh, improvement in endothelial function, and very importantly, after one year of being on the Mediterranean diet, uh, half the people with metabolic syndrome no longer had the criteria for metabolic syndrome. So we know the reason why this works, and uh, I'm going to be discussing some of the reasons why a Mediterranean diet helps to right the ship and helps to decrease adiposopathy and lower the risk of metabolic syndrome and lower the risk of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. How about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? We understand that if you have metabolic syndrome, if you have adiposopathy, you almost always have fatty liver. And, you know, it, it's really uh, kind of a signal that uh, adiposopathy is going on. And this article by Sophie and colleagues noted that among all the diets that have been proposed, a Mediterranean diet was the most effective dietary option for inducing weight loss together with beneficial effects on all the risk factors associated with metabolic syndrome and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that's important because we look at weight loss. Uh, we certainly uh, know that actually one of the major studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Iris Shea and colleagues uh, noted that the uh, Mediterranean diet and the low-carb diet were, uh, after 24 months, uh, you, people lost about the same amount of weight in both diets, and both of those diets were superior to a, to a vegetarian diet as far as weight loss. But we're talking about more than just losing weight in your patients. I know this is an obesity medicine conference, and people think about weight loss, but we're really just as important, uh, if not more important, is maintaining healthy fat tissue and, if, and having people lose weight but gain cardiometabolic health in the process. And that's critical that you understand that. So I'm going to now jump into some of the clinical trials that support this. And, you know, during this conference and during this morning session, I want all of you to ask yourself the question, where's the beef? And I don't mean that literally. But where's the clinical trial evidence to support whatever dietary plan that you feel is the best diet that has been shown in peer-reviewed journals in large numbers of individuals to lower cardiovascular mortality, lower cardiovascular morbidity, and prolong life of, from all causes. That's really what you want to be looking at. And it's more than just showing changes uh, on a study l using uh, certain uh, targets uh, or lipids or whatever else. Well, you know, certainly, uh, let me start with the NIH AARP study uh, by Mitral and colleagues. And this study showed that the more closely people in America adhered to a Mediterranean diet, the more they decreased their mortality risk. And it prompted Mitral to state that resorting to drug therapy for an epidemic caused by a maladaptive diet is less rational than realigning our eating habits with our physiologic needs. And I totally agree with him. This study is the HALE project. Uh, it's a European trial, and it uh, looked at people aged 70 to 90, and it uh, concluded that adherence to a Mediterranean diet and healthful lifestyle is associated with a more than 50% lower rate of all-cause and cause-specific mortality. 50%. This study was the GZ Prevention trial. This was the dietary arm of the GZ Prevention, an Italian trial. 
of, uh, of Italians post myocardial infarction. And it concluded that myocardial infarction patients can respond positively to simple dietary advice. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly regardless of any drug treatment prescribed, clinicians should routinely advise patients with myocardial infarction to increase their frequency of consumption of Mediterranean foods. This was a study by Castorini and colleagues, published in, the, uh, in JAK, the Journal of American College of Cardiology, of a meta-analysis of over 50 studies and over a half a million individuals, uh, with a punchline that the Mediterranean diet was associated with a 30% reduced risk of metabolic syndrome, and went on to state that these results are of considerable public health importance because this dietary pattern can easily be adopted to all populations in various cultures and cost effectively. And I think that's equally as important. This study was a landmark trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple years ago. And it was part of the PREDIMED study uh, from Spain. And it was a multi-center trial with over 7,000 uh, individuals uh, men and women at high cardiovascular risk, um, randomized to either a Mediterranean diet or a low-fat diet. This was a randomized trial. And the trial was actually stopped prematurely, short of five years, by the Data Safety and Monitoring Board because it was no longer considered to be ethical to continue the study due to a highly significant reduction in heart attack, stroke, and death in those subjects randomized to a Mediterranean diet. So the conclusion of this trial was that 30% of major CVD events, heart attack, strokes, and cardiovascular death can be prevented in high-risk individuals if they simply switch to a Mediterranean diet. And it had also, it was, this diet was also effective even in those individuals who are taking a statin. You know, a lot of the, our patients out there say, well, I'm taking the latest uh, statin of the day. I can eat whatever I want because I'm protected. Not so. This was kind of a sidearm of the, of the PREDIMED study. They, they, one one sidearm looked at uh, the Mediterranean diet enhanced with extra nuts, uh, and the other one was a Mediterranean diet enhanced with uh, extra, extra virgin olive oil. Both arms showed benefits. So that was really to see is there any one arm that was really more important than the other. But in general, the, it was all the components of the Mediterranean diet that were effective. So this also was important. Uh, there was another sub-study looking at uh, patients with type 2 diabetes. And this was very important, that a Mediterranean diet without calorie restriction seems to be effective in the prevention of diabetes in subjects at high cardiovascular risk. The incidence of diabetes was reduced by 52% in the Mediterranean diet group compared to the control group. Very important. I mean, I can go on and on about this. We know that uh, people who had high cardiovascular risk are placed on statins. Statins will actually increase uh, the risk of going from impaired fasting glucose to type 2 diabetes. We know that. So why not put somebody on a dietary pattern that lowers the risk of development of diabetes or can those who with diabetes can improve glycemic control? The Mediterranean diet uh, also in this study uh, was shown to uh, lower oxidized LDL. Uh, and that was especially true with the, uh, with the Mediterranean diet with those uh, uh, consuming uh, extra virgin olive oil in slightly higher amounts. Uh, it also lowered uh, inflammation, uh, it lowered CRP, lowered body weight, as you'd imagine, uh, improved endothelial function, significant lowering of uh, cholesterol, and on and on. This prompted, uh, the, after this study was released, uh, in the New York Times, it was on the front page, was this statement. This is a watershed moment in the field of nutrition. For the first time, a diet has been shown to have an effect as powerful as drugs in preventing what really matters to patients, heart attacks, strokes, and death from cardiovascular disease. This uh, study, uh, you know, which w looked at... Um, the Mediterranean diet, uh, dietary pattern uh, was another one that showed that a Mediterranean diet uh, was uh, maintained uh, uh, at a, a significant, profound, beneficial effect even four years after. This was the Leon diet heart study. 
And it, it, this was a profound study, which randomized people to either uh, a Mediterranean diet or a, a dietary pattern that looked uh, a lot like step one American Heart Association. And they found that in those randomized to the, uh, to, uh, the, um, to the Mediterranean diet had a 45% decrease in, in overall mortality. Think about that. 45% decrease in mortality in this study and a 70% decrease in cardiovascular mortality. That's huge. Alzheimer's disease. You know, this was a very interesting study by Nicholas Garmaeus and colleagues from Columbia Presbyterian came out a few years ago that concluded that a higher adherence to a Mediterranean diet is associated with a 40% reduction in the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, we you know there's a, we could talk about this later. Why is that? You know, we know that uh, Mediterranean diet of all the diets is probably the richest in the consumption of cold water fish and uh, you know, long chain uh, omega-3, EPA and DHA. DHA is essential for brain health. And uh, certainly we could discuss this at length. This study in JAMA looked at four important factors for longevity. Uh, Mediterranean diet, regular exercise, no smoking, like to moderate alcohol consumption, and the combination of the four factors lowered mortality rate by 65%. Another study uh, published in the British Medical Journal by Franco looked at the Mediterranean diet and those that consumed on a regular basis fish, wine, fruits, vegetables, garlic, almonds, dark chocolate. Daily consumption lowered cardiovascular disease risk by 76%. And there's the anti-aging part of the Mediterranean diet. We, this was a very fascinating uh, study. You have the reference in the handout. But it looked at telomere length. And we know that we, we shorten our telomeres is one of those things that leads to aging. Well, high adherence to a Mediterranean diet was associated with maintenance of telomere length and may help to explain the link between the Mediterranean diet and longevity. And there's this concept of healthy aging you know, which is defined as reaching the age of 70 uh, or older with no major impairment in physical function or mental health. And they showed that greater adherence to a Mediterranean diet in midlife was related to a 46% greater odds of healthy aging. Now, who is this lady? Who is this lady right here? This woman lives in Miami. She uh, descended from, uh, um, you know, her aunt, mother and father came from the south of France. And she is an active CEO. She uh, heads up a women's sportswear company. And she also is president of the Miami Poetry Society. And why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because this woman happens to be my mother, and next to her is my daughter, and this is a gathering two months ago when she celebrated her 98th birthday. So, and I know I'm going to be accused of being, this is anecdotal, but to me, this is the kind of thing that most people want, to live a vibrant, healthy life. Nobody wants to walk around taking a bunch of medications, and nobody wants to walk around you know, with a stroke or with congestive heart failure. And I think that really it's a flawed lifestyle is the reason that uh, many people cannot achieve uh, a, a healthy, long life. So let's dive into some of the components of a Mediterranean diet. Uh, if I went through every component of the Mediterranean diet, we, uh, you know, it'd be 6 o'clock uh, this evening and you know, uh, you certainly uh, wouldn't like that. So I'll go through this. It'll be a quick, deep dive. Red wine, which uh, we talked about, you know, the totality of evidence uh, shows that, you know, uh, red wine, which, uh, you know, contains a lot of flavonoids and polyphenols and resveratrol, a powerful antioxidant, it's consumed with meals. And that's an important point. You know, it l helps to lower uh, glucose. Uh, it, it slows down carbohydrate absorption when you drink red wine with meals. And it's, you know, you won't find in the Mediterranean regions, the classic traditional Mediterranean diet, people drinking red wine in isolation. They consume it with, with meals. It raises HDL, lowers anti, has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, antithrombotic properties. And uh, so it's beneficial. Vinegar, which a lot of people don't talk about vinegar, which, by the way, means sour wine. 
is actually very important. And before we had insulin, you know, we treated people with elevated sugar, blood sugar, with vinegar. It delays gastric emptying, delays carbohydrate absorption, reduces postprandial glucose, uh, reduces uh, uh, oxidative stress, and prolongs satiety. Olive oil. Now, again, I could talk about this all day long. Uh, the health benefits are, are vast, and you could read that. Uh, but I will tell you one thing. Uh, and here's one of the major problems as it relates to olive oil, as I see it. And that is... Um, most of the olive oil that you get off the shelf or your patients get off the shelf is processed olive oil. It's not the so-called extra virgin cold-pressed olive oil. And if it's, not, if it's processed, forget it. You're not getting any of the benefits from it. So how do you determine that? Well, interestingly, we're very close uh, to the one place where we can be sure and our patients can be sure that we're not dealing with a processed olive oil, and that's the California Olive Oil Council. And if it has a stamp of approval of the California Olive Oil Council, and they are on their website, I encourage everybody to go to, to, to that. I have no affiliation with them, but I think it's excellent because they, I've, I've seen their work. They are very strict. They do samples. They send off laboratory samples of the olive oil. They go there on site. They make sure. You have to jump through a lot of hoops. But if you are, at least you could be sure that you're getting all these health benefits from improved lipid pan, uh, profile to lower postprandial glucose, anti-inflammatory, all those things. And by the way, it also, olive oil, contains a, an antioxidant called EGCG, which is an anti-HER2 oncogene. And we know that uh, there is a lowering of uh, breast cancer. Um, I know there's a breast cancer session this afternoon, but all of these things are important. I could spend a whole day on this slide. How about uh, uh, fiber and um, dietary fiber? Well, we know that uh, you know, certainly fiber, and especially fiber, cereal fiber, whole grain fiber, is very important. And weight gain was inversely uh, associated with intake of uh, high fiber uh, foods. Um, and, but then this is very important, but it's po positively associated with refined grain foods. So if you're eating whole grains, uh, you basically have the, uh, the bran uh, intact, the germ intact, and you certainly, it's beneficial to lose weight, to lower your risk of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. If it's refined grains, throw it out the window. You know, all bets are off. And so that's important. And uh, this was a study on nut consumption. And again, I could spend a long time on this. There were five major studies on the benefit of nut consumption. Uh, and shows that, you know, nuts, as we know, are mainly monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Uh, and um, substituting uh, nut fat for saturated fat was associated with a 45% reduction in CHD risk. Um, this was the, uh, uh, the uh, Adventist uh, health study, which showed a 48% uh, reduction uh, in cardiovascular events so with substantially fewer uh, fatal CHD events just from regular nut consumption. And again, I can go on and on on this. The references are there. I encourage you to read that. It's all part of a Mediterranean diet. Fruits and vegetables, you know, um, this particular study looked at um, uh, that um, uh, the increasing intake of fruits and vegetables reduced long-term risk of obesity. Uh, I, I could go article after article about fruits and vegetables in the Nurses' Health Study and many other studies, large clinical trials showing that a wide variety of fruits and vegetables of all different color that bring all different an antioxidants uh, to the table uh, lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer, and chronic degenerative diseases. How about omega-3 fatty acids? As I said, the Mediterranean diet, one of the reasons I think that the Mediterranean diet is so effective at lowering cardiovascular risk, and especially sudden cardiac death, is because it's very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, both uh, alpha-linolenic acid, uh, but especially EPA and DHA, because only about 5 to 10% of alpha-linolenic acid is converted to EPA and DHA, which is very important. And if you look at it, um, and many of you don't realize this, but deficiency of omega-3... Uh, is one of the top 10 causes of preventable death in America. And, you know, I could tell you right now, you ask the average person on the street, what's your omega-3 level? 
They don't know. Most doctors aren't ordering it. It's low-hanging fruit. It's one of the easiest things I could do is measure your omega-3. If it's low, I could replace that in two weeks and protect my patient from ending up like Tim Russert with sudden and unexpected cardiac events, sudden cardiac death. And if you think you're going to wait till somebody has a problem and then spring into action, say, well, I guess, you know, uh, uh, John's in the emergency room or Mary's in the emergency room with an elephant sitting on the chest. Maybe I should have checked that omega-3. Forget it. It's one of the most cost-effective things we could do. Prompting uh, researchers like Dr. Darish Mazafarian from Harvard to state that modest consumption of fish or fish oil together with smoking cessation and regular exercise should be among the first-line treatments for the prevention of CHD death and sudden cardiac death. And if you look, this is a really a sentinel uh, uh, article published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the cardiovascular benefits of uh, omega-3 fatty acids. And again, I could spend all day going through this, but uh, they're vast. Omega-3s, as we know, lower triglycerides. They reduce inflammation, lower blood pressure, uh, lower um, the um, uh, heart rate variability, and thereby reduce the risk of fatal arrhythmias, improve insulin sensitivity, and on and on. The last one's also very important because it lowers the risk of an inflammatory atherosclerotic plaque, the types of plaques that are more prone to rupture, the first plaque that I showed you when I started my lecture. The U.S. Physicians Health Study showed that consumption of at least one fish meal per week reduced the risk of sudden cardiac death by 52% compared to those consuming fish once per month. And this study, if this doesn't get your attention, nothing will. This looked at the risk of sudden cardiac death. This was a study done uh, at Harvard by Catherine Albert, my friend Paul Ritker, and colleagues. And it showed that if you uh, have, uh, if you're in the uh, upper tertile, quartile of omega-3 levels, we use the omega-3 index. If we're talking then about an omega-3 index of 7% or greater compared to an omega-3 index of less than 4%, you have a 90% reduction in risk of sudden cardiac death. 90%. How many people are doing this on a regular basis with their patients? Very few. I know because I go across the country lecturing. And this is, some, this is low-hanging fruit. And it's a shame when, when we can have a disease that we can prevent, take, taking a lot of people out of the prime of their life, leaving you know, children at home to grow up without a father or a mother. Shameful. We should be measuring this. We should be treating. It's simple. Have the person eat more cold water fish, uh, omega-3 rich fish, put them on an omega-3 supplement, get a follow-up level, make sure they're protected. Nurses' health study, uh, again, showed uh, higher consumption of fish. And, I mean, I could go on and on about this. Uh, Large-scale trials. Uh, this is Penny Chris Etherton. Bill Harris uh, looked at... Uh, meta-analysis of over a quarter of a million participants, inverse relationship between fish consumption and morbidity and mortality from coronary heart disease. How about the DART trial? The DART trial showed that uh, if uh, you, uh, these were patients post-myocardial infarction, either fish or fish oil lowered the risk of, uh, of uh, all-cause mortality uh, by almost 30%. Um, the GZ Prevention trial, which I talked about earlier, but this was the part of the GZ Prevention that took Italians post myocardial infarction and gave them 850 milligrams of a fish oil capsule that had both EPA and DHA, and found that uh, after one year there was a 21% reduction in total mortality, a 30% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Now, don't fall off your seat. There was a 45% reduction in sudden cardiac death after only four months. I mean, the handwriting's on the wall, as far as I'm concerned. Stroke. We know that there's a significant inverse relationship between omega-3 consumption uh, and, uh, and stroke. We're talking about thrombotic stroke, not hemorrhagic stroke. And in this particular uh, study, uh, published in JAMA, there was a 50% reduction in stroke risk if fish was consumed twice a week. Again, it should be omega-3 rich type of fish. And uh, this was just more evidence basically to show more of the same and I could drown you with evidence. Really, I'm, I'm emphasizing this because this is one of the reasons why a Mediterranean diet is so powerful. And I think it's because, of, and it's not because of just omega-3 or just because of the red wine or just 
because of the fruits and vegetables. It's, it's everything that's in, in it. The fiber we already talked about, and uh, fiber is very important. This was a study by Walter Wellett uh, and his colleagues that showed that it post myocardial infarction, those that ate the most fiber had a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, and it really, if you look at this particular uh, uh, chart, it really, that much of that mortality reduction from fiber is from cereal fiber, cereal grain fiber, uh, and both uh, all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Now, let me talk about red meat. I think this is important. I think red meat uh, increases our mortality. I think there's enough scientific evidence to support that. I'm not against red meat. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm not an advocate of uh, you know necessarily a, uh, no red meat. And I think that um, I am an advocate of what the published data shows. And the published data shows that we should reduce the amount of red meat consumption and absolutely stay away from processed red meat, not only driving cardiovascular disease, but also cancer. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and it's certainly, um, if you are going to have red meat, and I tell my patients, if you like steak, go have a good steak, uh, you know, a couple times a month and whatever. No, don't eat processed meat. And if you can't, try to, you know, eat uh, lean red meat that's uh, not highly processed. Heme iron, we know that it's in red meat. Uh, you look at this data uh, that was published uh, uh, um, a couple of years ago that uh, certainly uh, not, uh, that heme iron was associated with a 57% increase in the risk of CVD over 10 years. Um, this is fascinating data um, by Stanley Hazen and his group at the Cleveland Clinic looking at Red meat contains carnitine and choline, which is then taken up by intestinal bacteria and converted to trimethylamine oxide, which is then uh, absorbed into the uh, bloodstream and increases the risk of atherosclerotic disease for the number of mechanisms. One of them is facilitating entry into the cells of atherogenic lipoproteins and on and on. This was a recent study uh, looking at adherence to a Mediterranean diet significantly lowered TMAO levels. And this was one of the, 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 one of the granddaddies of all studies by uh, Rashmi Sinha and his colleagues from the NIH. That was a huge study, 250,000 men, 250,000 women, randomized to red meat, basically um, about five ounces uh, once a day versus five ounces once a week and followed these people over 10 years and noted a significant decrease in mortality, total mortality, along with cancer mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, and those randomized to five ounces of red meat once a week. So they're not saying, you know, we're not saying no red meat at all. We're saying, you know, in, in moderation, and certainly that moderation is a couple times a month. Uh, and as far as processed meat, forget it. They found that even just... Uh, randomizing uh, people who even had just a small amount of processed meat still had increased uh, risk. So the processed meat is really dangerous. I don't, and what are we talking about? Salami, bologna, hot dogs, and the like. And we could talk about that all day, too. But the question is, one of the questions that come up, should saturated fat be reduced in a heart-healthy diet? That's another issue. Uh, I think a lot of the problems with red meat is beyond saturated fat, but this is, issue comes up a lot. But one of the things I want to share with you is the fact that there's been a lot of uh, things talking about, well, butter is back, butter is good, and look at the study. Let's look at the science. Let's not look at, uh, this is not an emotional debate, this is a scientific debate. And this study by Wardlaw and colleagues noted that uh, compared with values for a butter-based diet, the vegetable oil diet, which is, of course, polyunsaturated fats, um, you know, had... Uh, um, 20% lowering of total cholesterol, um, a 26% lowering of uh, LDL cholesterol, 21% lowering of triglycerides, and very importantly, almost a 30% reduction in ApoB lipoproteins. These are the atherogenic lipoproteins that get into the arterial wall over a lifetime, which raises the risk of cardiovascular events. Uh, this was Frank Hugh, uh, Ron Krauss, uh, and colleagues noted that the important thing is that it's not a question, and we made a big mistake when we declared war on fat years ago, and we said, you know, they, we shouldn't be eating as much fat, and what did the food industry do? They said, okay, we'll replace it with refined sugar and refined starches. 
uh, and our sugar consumption went through the roof. Well, nobody's recommending me that. That was foolish. And as a result, the important thing is, if you want to lower cardiovascular events and get, gain clinical benefit, you should replace saturated fat with unsaturated fat, period. And the data is, uh, is, is there. I could, I could show you data all day long about this. this look at this uh, data here where you could see that uh, if you substitute um, monounsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fat, or whole grains for saturated fat, you lower, significantly lower cardiovascular risk. However, if you substitute uh, refined sugar or trans fat, you increase risk. And, you know, so certainly uh, the risk of coronary heart disease is reduced when saturated fat is replaced with polyunsaturated fat. So it, um, in conclusion, what I tried to show you today to stay on time uh, was that therapeutic lifestyle intervention is indeed the first line approach for the treatment and prevention of our number one killer across the United States and around the world, cardiovascular disease. And that the Mediterranean diet and lifestyle has been shown in peer-reviewed clinical trials to improve cardiometabolic health and lower the risk of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease. And I'd like to close my lecture with a great quote from Demetrius. Now, who's Demetrius? Demetrius is a Greek peasant living on an island of Crete. And uh, in his village, uh, he celebrated his 100th birthday. And this came in the village newspaper, and somebody sent this to me, and I love this quote. They said, Demetrius, what's the secret of, uh, of your long life? And he said, I walk every day. I work in my garden, and I eat fresh food from the earth and the sea, and I enjoy my midday meal with a glass of wine surrounded by my family and friends. Well, Demetrius, I couldn't say it any better. Thank you very much. We do have time for a couple of questions. Uh, first question, uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, what is an alternative to red wine for those who do not drink alcohol but want similar benefits? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, um, it's been shown in a number of trials that um, uh, grape juice uh, also contains uh, a lot of the antioxidants and resveratrol. Uh, and um, I'm a little bit cautious about using, advising people to, to drink grape juice juice because of the sugar content in that. Um, and I think that uh, certainly as it relates to alcohol, uh, I think that we understand, I, I never sit down with a patient and tell a patient to start drinking alcohol of any type, whether it's red wine, beer, spirits, to lower cardiovascular risk. In the, the data, if you look at the totality of data, alcohol in moderation, which we define as one drink a day for a woman, two, drink a day, two drinks a day for a man. We're talking wine, five ounces, beer, 12 ounces, spirits, 1.5 ounce. Um, you know, but it's a, the, a, called a J-shaped rate, uh, a sharp curve, because as soon as you get out of that low consumption, you increase risk of a lot of disease states, including cancer, uh, and, you know, we know addiction, car accidents, et cetera. So my mantra is that for people who already drink, I advise them to drink in moderation, and maybe there is some benefit, and especially those living in the Mediterranean region and been doing it for thousands of years. As I showed you, there are benefits of consumption of red wine with meals. Next question, are omega-3 slash DHA pills just as effective in reducing cardiovascular risk as through dietary intake? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, there's, no, there's an EPA-only product. There's no uh, to my knowledge, uh, I think there's some in development of DHA-only products. But the fact of the matter is that the American Heart Association, and I endorse this, recommends that we should consume um, we should um, omega-3 rich fish as the first. We shouldn't go running to the health food store and buy omega-3 capsules. Uh, but the important point is not everybody absorbs it the same. Uh, not everybody, uh, you know, is, is able to get adequate levels. 
Um, and that has a lot to do with delta-5 and delta-6 desaturate enzymes and polymorphism, loss of function uh, of that. So that convert, um, you know, our alpha-linolenic acid to EPA and DHA. So it's recommended that diet should be the first-line approach. And, but it's also, I recommend, that we measure the level, like I mentioned. Because if you are consuming cold water fish and you're not there, you haven't achieved an adequate omega-3 blood level, then my patients are going to get there because I'm going to put them on omega-3 supplementation. I feel very strongly about that because the, the data is there. And it's low-hanging fruit. It's what we call the risk-benefit ratio. It weighs heavily in favor of doing that. Next question. Uh, should we recommend the Mediterranean diet for patients with insulin resistance, type 1, and or type 2 diabetes? Right. Well, you know, if you looked at the PretiMed study, it was actually shown, and, and also Catherine Esposito's data, that it's uh, actually one of the best uh, diets uh, to use in the uh, diabetic population or the pre-diabetic population, individuals with insulin resistance, impaired fasting glucose, uh, for, a ver for a lot of reasons. And, um, you know, and, and one of the things, I'll go back to omega-3, which improves insulin sensitivity and you know, certainly a Mediterranean diet is rich in that, along with uh, it uh, really does not have the types of uh, processed foods that really push us uh, down the line of, uh, of uh, impaired fasting glucose to graduate with type 2 diabetes. I like to push my patients in the opposite direction. So there's plenty of clinical trial evidence that this is probably one of the preferred diets. And if you look at the uh, the Shea data uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, this was the optimal diet for people with diabetes or trying to prevent diabetes, improving glycemic control compared to a low-carb diet or a vegetarian diet. That's New England Journal of Medicine. Okay, I think we're just about out of time for more questions, uh, but uh, we'll also be having a panel after lunch, so get your questions answered, and I'm sure if you see Dr. Oscar, he'll probably Absolutely. be very passionate about this. I'm sure you'll answer your questions. Thank you very much.